Major funding for Through Deaf Eyes is provided by... This program has been made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding for more than 30 years of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Annenberg Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. I was driving down on the freeway. Oh, it was a beautiful day. All the birds were flying, <laughs> and all the birds were thinking, <laughs> and all the birds dropping, <laughs> hey, you. <laughs> Uh -huh. I got you there. All of a sudden, I look at the rear view mirror. The guy behind me was still angry. Hey, you! What are you, deaf, huh? Wow, that makes me angry. Of course, I'm deaf and proud. Do I step on the guy? Oh, by the way, I have a Mercedes 500 SEL. I'm wish and them. Thank you very much. Finally, I caught up with that car. <laughs> Automatic window. <laughs> hey, you, what are you hearing, huh? <laughs> yeah. When you talk to people who can hear and you ask them, what do you think it would be like to be a deaf person? Then all of their thinking is, well, I couldn't do this. Can't, 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 can't. They would start listing all the things they can't do. And I don't think like that. Deaf people don't think like that. We think about what we can do. We sign, we make movies, we do stage performances, we can write books, but we make ourselves understood. Say the word airplane. Airplane. Take a quiz. Ready? True or false? All deaf people use sign language. Sign language is universal. Deaf people live in a silent world. Having a deaf child is a tragedy. All deaf people would like to be cured. Hint. The answers are all going to be false. There was a little girl, a neighbor girl, that came over and played with me, and we used gesture with each other. One time I went over to visit her, and I saw her using her lips to communicate with her mother. They weren't using their hands at all. And so I ran home and I asked my mother what was happening. Why aren't they using their hands? My mother said, they're hearing. And I said, oh, well, what are we? She said, Daddy and I are deaf. You're deaf, your brothers are deaf. And I said, is everyone deaf? Is that little girl the only hearing girl in the world? She said, no, everyone else is like them. And I said, oh, now I get it. Deafness is almost always one generation thick. Over 90% of all deaf people have parents who can hear. And most deaf parents have children who can hear. So deaf people interact on a meaningful and intimate level with hearing people all their lives. Yet most Americans have very little understanding of what it means to be deaf. I was doing an interview once with CNN and a woman and I were getting ready, getting our makeup ready, and I mean, it was just live, in front of millions of people. I was ready to be interviewed, and everybody was in their positions, and with three seconds before the light was to come on the camera, the interviewer needed my attention, and she said, Marley, my dog is deaf, like you. 
And the next thing I know, the light is on the camera, and there I am live, and I'm thinking in the back of my head, does she want to throw me a bone? Does she want me to identify with her dog? I, I had no idea what the significance of that was. People need to realize that we're normal. Don't just look at my ear. Don't look at it as a physical handicap. We're normal, really. Yes, we do have some accommodations to be made to survive in a society where it's dominated by hearing people. But at the same time, if you were to come into the room and it would be full of deaf people, then you would need the accommodation too. 35 million Americans are hard of hearing to some degree. Of these, an estimated 300,000 people are profoundly deaf. Deaf people can be found in every ethnic group, every region, every economic class. Some deafness is hereditary. Some is caused by illness or accident. To be deaf is to be part of a tiny minority in a hearing world. But it is far from the uniform and tragic experience that most hearing people imagine. Being deaf is, uh, well, it's part of me, uh, something I have to deal with, but doesn't keep me from being happy, doesn't make me either happy or sad. It's just like being a man instead of a woman or being tall instead of short. Maybe a person can't see, and is that normal? Maybe it is, and maybe a person walks with a bit of a limp. Perhaps that's normal to one person and not to another. What about left-handedness? Is that abnormal or is that normal? We have two children. We have Bradford here, who's probably the only kid in town who can talk on the phone and play basketball at the same time. He is our only hearing child. He has to sign all the time because there's no one else in the family who is hearing. Our daughter's 11. She's deaf. We have just the two, and we don't want any more. We have a boy and a girl, and that's enough for us. I guess we're the all-American family. Just the four of us. It's a nice number. Today, it's entirely possible for a deaf family to call itself an all-American family. But that isn't how the story begins. For centuries, hearing people saw deafness as a horrendous misfortune. When a Protestant revival swept through 19th century America, fervent Christians labored to bring the gospel to unbelievers. But one group of souls seemed locked away forever from the word of God. Most of the deaf people in America in the early 1800s lived in rural areas. They were separated from each other. They were isolated. Most had very little communication with the people around them. Deaf people had a limited understanding of what they could do, of their own possibilities. And people with deaf children really had no idea what their children could achieve. Very few Americans believed that deaf people could be educated at all. Until 1817, when a Connecticut clergyman named Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet discovered his mission in life, to bring the gospel to people who could not hear. In Hartford, he opened the first permanent school for deaf children in America with just seven students and a head teacher from France, who is now a legend in the deaf community. Laurent Clare was a teacher at the Paris Institution for the Deaf, and he was an extremely well-educated, sharp, witty man who was very, very deaf and had been very, very deaf since infancy. One of the things that Claire brought to the United States was French Sign Language. Laurent Claire taught using his hands. He communicated with sign. To Gallaudet, the language was a revelation. He called it highly poetical. To Claire and to many deaf people, signing was natural and practical. Claire discovered that there were already some signs in use by some of his students. Claire took his native French sign language and he blended it with a little bit of the signs that he saw students using here in the United States. 
The result was an American Sign Language that spread west and south as new schools for deaf children opened. New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln signed a law founding the first college in the world for deaf students. Eventually, it would be called Gallaudet University. And all these schools used sign. My dear sir, the organs of speech are in no way affected by deafness. The deaf person is mute simply because he cannot hear and hasn't been taught to speak. A contradiction in terms, sir. A most illogical contradiction. The deep mute speech organs may be intact. Agreed. In April 1871, a bright young Scottish immigrant, Alexander Graham Bell, began teaching deaf children in Boston. Like Gallaudet, he had a passion and a mission to bring language to deaf people. Nature inflicted upon the deaf child with one flaw, one little flaw, imperfect hearing. But we deny him speech by not teaching him to speak. Society in general views Alexander Graham Bell as an American hero, as the inventor of the telephone. He was famous, wealthy, and influential. His wife was deaf. His own mother was deaf. He was always associating with the deaf community. He was a teacher of deaf children at a day school in Boston. He was very familiar with the deaf world. Alexander Graham Bell is a very important figure in deaf folklore. He offers an antagonist perspective because he's like the boogeyman. And even though he's a great man in his own right, he did put forth the idea that a life without signing would be a better life. Bell thought that signing prevented deaf people from learning to speak. So he was against deaf people using sign, their natural language. Bell believed that sign language marked them as different and kept them in the lower classes. He believed that earlier in the 1800s, sign language had been their only recourse. But now, there's a better choice, the technology to teach them to speak and lip read, the oral method. Bell thought over 100 years ago that if every deaf child received the right type of education and the use of the right technology, that those children could learn to use spoken language. Oral schools for deaf children opened in the late 1860s. They did not teach sign and, in fact, outlawed its use. Instead, they began speech training, teaching deaf children to generate sounds, to mimic the mouth shapes and breathing patterns of speech. And if children knew what speech looked like, the oralist thought, they could learn to read lips. This was an idea that divided educators of deaf children, and it still does today. Here's one man's take on lip reading from Audism by deaf filmmaker Rene Visco. do you lip read? That's a very dangerous question, because if you say yes, I'm well, wait, wait a minute, no, I have to go slower. Lip. <laughs> no, 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 just tap normally. Here's like, it's been hectic and we haven't had a lot of time to prepare, but it's a take home. But I, I mean, we had all this homework and quizzes and stuff, so I just lucked out. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take a look at it? I have it with I can understand I people who stick directly to me in good light without too much background noise. And a lot of what I do in speaking is arranging these circumstances. And uh, if, that, if that doesn't happen, I don't hear things. I can be part of a conversation without knowing what the other people are saying.
Speaking, lip reading, and participation in normal conversation was from the beginning the great goal of the oralist method. In 1880, the method was endorsed by an important international conference of educators in Milan, Italy. Oralism was beginning to win. Schools for deaf children all over the United States started one by one changing, deciding that their particular school was not going to use sign language in the classroom anymore. They changed their hiring practices. The teachers were forbidden to sign, and the children were forbidden to sign. After the Milan Congress, the percentage of deaf teachers went way down because they couldn't teach speech. Those schools that were strong supporters of deaf teachers moved them to the vocational programs to avoid the parents' objections to them. Those were the dark ages for deaf education in America. Bell subscribed to two popular American movements that greatly bolstered the oralist cause. One was nativism, the belief that the current flood of immigrants was threatening the American way of life. Many people were immigrating to this country from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and this made a number of Americans very nervous. Ethnic groups often set up their own schools here. They published newspapers in their native languages. The deaf community, too, had their own newspapers, their own schools, and their own churches, and used a separate language. So people began to think of deaf people as an ethnic group, a group that should be assimilated into the general population. Bell was famous for going to school boards and to state legislatures and arguing that American Sign Language was, in fact, a language borrowed from France. Sign language was not supportive of American society. Bell was also a prominent leader in another movement that was newly popular in America, eugenics, the idea that planned breeding can improve the human race. A defective race of human beings would be a great calamity, Bell wrote. We must examine the causes that lead to the intermarriage of the deaf with the object of applying a remedy. He was an early eugenicist. He was quite concerned that if the deaf married other deaf individuals, there would be an expansion of the deaf community. He did not see this as a desirable thing. He wanted to uh, try to eliminate deaf organizations if he could, find other ways to socialize deaf people among hearing people rather than deaf people. I think that Alexander Graham Bell's greatest crime was keeping deaf people apart from each other. It wasn't so much that he thought speech was important. Worse than that was that he didn't want deaf people to marry each other. He didn't want them to be near each other. He wanted them to be apart. But deaf children had to be educated, and the only practical way was in all deaf schools, for the most part, residential schools. Here, deaf children played together, shared stories, invented games, passed on unique customs and basic values. Even at oral schools, students would teach each other signing on the sly. It was all part of what would, in time, become deaf culture. The schools for the deaf really were the first place where deaf people came together, and they shared their language, they shared their culture, they shared their stories about growing up. At times, they had to grow up quickly. Children were often dropped off at boarding schools without understanding what was happening. Many arrived without even knowing their own names. From the age of four on up, they might be away from their families for months at a time. The first day at school, my mother said, Oh, Bernard, now you're in school. And I want you to be a good boy. Work hard, learn all you can. And I said, yes, I understand. But what? She said goodbye. And she gave me a hug, and she turned around and left. And I thought, why? And suddenly, the superintendent took me by the hand and pulled me down the hallway. Well, years later, I spoke with my mom and said, why did you leave me like that? 
Why didn't you sit and explain that this school was a boarding school and that I would stay there Monday through Friday? Why didn't you explain all that? You just left. And my mother said, I know. I just couldn't bring myself to say that. And then I understood. It was hard for her, too. When I went into the school for the deaf, I was about five, and I was so thrilled to get mail, a letter from my mom. My favorite holiday was Christmas. I always looked forward to the Christmas holiday. My mother would write on a card, only two more sleeps and you will be home. It was counting the days for me to see how many days I would have to sleep at school before I was sleeping at home in the bunk bed with my brother. So it helped me have a sense of counting down to the time when I would be going home. The students always had each other. It was like a big family. And we learned a lot from each other. Maybe some things we learned were wrong, and we may have had the wrong information sometimes, but we were a family. And some of us had no communication at home. So we could share with each other, advise each other, help each other. One tradition was a special sign that students invented for each other, a sign they might keep for life, their name sign. When I got to the campus, to the Alabama School for the Deaf, I didn't have a name sign yet. And after thinking about it for a while, and this is pretty typical of deaf people, they look to see what your character is, how you behave, a personality trait, and then they give you a name sign that sort of ties into that particular trait that's unique to you. Well, after time went by, my friend said, I got it. I know the way you swivel your hips when you walk, and so we're going to give you this name sign. So it went from my elbow down to my hip. I didn't know I had that little bit of a swivel with my hip. I thought I walked just like everybody else, but that name sign was given, and it's stuck ever since. <laughs> Students might sign to each other, but not in class. For most of the 20th century, the vast majority of deaf teaching was based almost exclusively on spoken language. You weren't allowed to use sign during class. If you used sign during class, you would be punished. They would make you put on white mitts, and they would have strings attached to them so you wouldn't be able to use your hands. <laughs> Many people don't realize that when children learn speech, it's all repetition, speech training over and over again. Think of all the time I spent on it when I could have learned other things, be educated in other things. I spent so much time learning how to talk, how to say milk, cat, dog. <clears throat> Hours, holding my face, pushing my mouth, making things go back and forth, trying to make the right movements. This is an M. Awful. There have always been what's referred to as oral failures. The technology of the day was limited. Uh, and, and those children may have had more difficulty developing spoken language. Over a period of a few months, our class has been able to learn approximately 50 nouns. Now their skills are being advanced by writing and saying from memory. I write it. Even the adults today 
who talk about oral failures. They are thinking about their own experiences going to the speech teacher or being at an oral school for the deaf and not being successful and are really struggling to communicate. Right. Finish it. You're finished. You forgot. That's right. Sit down, Flynn. I can say that I was considered a successful oral person. For many years, I was mainstreamed in a public school. I was able to use my speech with my family and my friends. I had a lot of speech training. I used hearing aids and was trained auditorily. But in my mid-20s, when I went to graduate school, or I was in graduate school, I realized how hard I was working just trying to lip read. It would just completely wear me out. My oral abilities were limited. I learned vocabulary in English, but I couldn't speak it. My parents were relying on my speech, so I couldn't show them my intelligence. You asked me to speak so, you, so I could demonstrate how successful I was as an oral deaf person, but I understand that speaking is only one way, and that if I speak, the other person hears me. They assume that I don't need any sort of interpreting or any any kind of sign or anything like that. They, as, they assume that I can hear them. That's the problem with speaking. It's a two-way communication. So that's why I don't. Because I don't want people to assume that I can't hear them. <laughs> I can't. But it's much easier just to turn off my voice. I have always had my feet firmly in both the hearing world and the deaf world. I've always felt very comfortable in both worlds. I've always been hungry for for information about both worlds. I've always wanted to be connected to people, to humanity. It didn't matter whether they were hearing or deaf, and I'm very fortunate that I have the communication skills to do so relatively com comfortably. I know that my speed is not exactly normal, but it's very understandable that cutting me through uh, situations in communicating with hearing people. It's common for deaf people to talk about two worlds, one hearing and one deaf. At times, these worlds seem to be two different planets. And so a special notion has evolved in the deaf community, a separate planet of sight without sound. We have this planet, which we call Earth. We spell it E-A-R-T-H, so it relates to the ear, to speaking and hearing. There's this other planet, E-Y-E-T-H, and that relates to the eye and the visual. So there are two worlds. I grew up on Earth. Now I'm on this other planet, E-Y-E-T-H, a world where all these possibilities are open to me. And now an attempt to reach the deaf planet. Destination Ioth by deaf filmmaker Arthur Loon. But back in the early 20th century, America was on the planet Earth, not on the imaginary planet of Ioth. On Earth, discrimination against deaf people was so much a fact of life that by 1880, they had founded an organization to protect themselves, the National Association of the Deaf. In 1906, the US Civil Service flatly stated that it would no longer allow deaf people to work for the government. So the NAD and its president prepared for battle. George W. Vedditz was the seventh president of the NAD. He was loud, 
forceful, clear, and not ashamed. He got up and spoke out. The fiery Vedettes launched an aggressive grassroots campaign against the civil service decision. Letters poured in to elected officials. After two years of protest, Theodore Roosevelt repealed the guidelines. Deaf people had won the right to work for their country. The deaf themselves fought shoulder to shoulder, a proud Vedettes wrote. George W. Vedettes was one of the most well-known presidents of the National Association of the Deaf. He was a beautiful writer, a beautiful signer, really a genius in every sense of the word. George Vedettes knew four languages. He raised chickens, wrote poetry, and worked as a printer, teacher, and newspaper editor. He won horticultural awards for his dahlias at the Colorado State Fair and once earned a draw with the world chess champion in an exhibition match. In 1910, he started yet another project, making movies. Starting around 1910, the NAD produced films in an effort to preserve sign language, shooting footage of signing masters. They raised funds and then produced a variety of films that showed these masters telling deaf people stories. Before the invention of film, when sign language was shown, it was static. A drawing couldn't show the movement. The deaf community finally had a way to show what real sign language looked like. The NAD films were like all the other films from their era, silent. Deaf actors were made for the medium. They could play hearing characters or deaf ones. Silent films showed deaf characters as being dummies, objects of humor, but at least the deaf person could watch the film and understand it. That was lost after 1929. Now a gala event ushers in a new era in motion pictures. With the premiere of a jazz singer starring Al Jolson, sound comes to the screen. The transition from silent uh, movies to talkies was a disaster for deaf people. Another party? And what a party. We had to leave before it was half over. The talkies didn't change one thing. Deaf characters were still stereotypes. Johnny Belinda won an Academy Award in 1948. The character, Belinda, is seen as this poor, innocent, weak woman. Her deafness makes her even more vulnerable. The fact that this dummy character blossoms by using sign language was enough. The deaf community was excited and proud of the film. Uh, even though the, the stereotype itself was, was, was terrible. Belinda, searching, ever searching for happiness and understanding, but ready to fight with primitive fury. I was concerned that my friends would see that character and think that all deaf people were, were like that. Hollywood films weren't made for deaf people, but they had been creating their own diversions for years. Deaf communities had theatrical societies, literary circles, masquerade balls, organized debates, sports teams, and travel groups. The deaf culture that had taken root in the schools for deaf children cropped up all across the country in deaf clubs for adults. People came together to sign, 
to help each other, and quite simply, to have a good time. parents were deaf. My parents had many uh, deaf friends. Uh, they had an active uh, schedule. We went to the deaf clubs, uh, went to deaf people's homes. It was a natural community for me as a kid growing up. Like a kid who grew up in a uh, immigrant uh, family where many of the friends spoke a different language. Instead of speaking Italian, our family spoke sign. I love you. I love George Washington. I love my country, too. I love the flag, the dear old flag of red and white and blue. In Akron, Ohio, for example, they had a football and baseball team that consistently trounced hearing teams. Deaf people were intensely proud of that accomplishment, proud that their team could defeat a hearing one. In broader society, the status of deaf people frequently seemed inferior. But here, they could level that distance, be seen as equal to anybody else. Gallaudet had one of the first college teams in the Washington, D.C. area. And legend has it that in the 1890s, deaf players made an innovation that would change the sport of football. The team would get together and they would sign to each other. And they realized somebody that they were playing against on a hearing football team knew sign language and could read their plays. And so instead of just standing around discussing their strategy, they stood together in a huddle. Deaf athletes were anyone's equal on the gridiron or the baseball field, but this equality did not apply in the wider world. Most hearing people regarded deafness as a problem, pure and simple, and the general inclination was almost always, fix it. If you read and study the history of deaf America, you'll find that some parents will try anything to quote, cure their deaf child. Fathers like mine who try different ways for their deaf sons to get their hearing back again. Most common one dealt with for every pain fight. They would try to uh, pain, bring the deaf boy in the cockpit, the pain would take off and do Oops. Open the boy will get his hearing back again. A surprising number of American parents turned to aviation for a cure. In his early career, the pilot Charles Lindbergh charged $50 for what he called deaf flights. But more often, parents put their hopes in medicine. Doctor put on like a helmet, strapped and put earplugs rubber caps in my ears. And then it was attached to mm, um, box, uh, remote control or something. And he said, then I'm going to turn it on and it will slowly increase uh, heat waves. And if medicine did not work, maybe baseball. My father thought, mm, Maybe if Bob can meet Baby Ruth, the Bambino, maybe he'd get a shock, a thrill, and get his hearing again. The babe comes out, says, hi, oh, you kid. May I shook hands. I was thinking I shook hands with the babe. <laughs> it was wonderful. But 
I never got my hearing back. I was deaf as a poster. <laughs> My aunt took me to this revival. Then they called me and took me up there, and I stood there in front of the preacher. And he touched my ear and just sort of shook, and he started praying and shouting and shaking me. I was so embarrassed. I didn't know what the hell he was trying to do. I had no idea. And after a while, he gave up. Later, I learned that it was my fault because he said I didn't have enough faith. So that's why you're speaking to a deaf man today. I'm a proud person who happens to be deaf. I don't want to change it. I don't want to wake up and suddenly say, oh my God, I can hear. That's not my dream. It's not my dream. I've been raised deaf. I'm used to the way I am. I don't want to change it. Why would I ever want to change it? Because I'm used to it. I'm happy. After my third child was born, our doctor came up to us saying that our baby might not be able to hear. My response is, oh, for crying out loud. We have two children who are deaf. Oh, I'm ready to take my child home. No more power. Even in the first decades of the 20th century, deaf people wanted to focus on what they could do, not what they couldn't. In residential schools, they were taught manual trades, shoemaking, woodworking, printing, frequently with great success. When they encountered a problem, they often came up with their own solution. Few companies would sell life insurance to deaf people, so deaf businessmen founded their own company to do exactly that. And when deaf people felt excluded from church services, they held their own. A congregation which can neither hear nor speak comes to the Evangelical Church of the Deaf each Sunday to worship together. The congregation, through sign language, brings new beauty and majesty to age-old church rituals. I was born hearing, and then later I became deaf. I started going to a hearing church to worship, but I was missing so much. When I found out about a deaf church, I thought I'd try that. And I saw the choir signing music, and the drum, and I felt so inspired. The preacher was good. And I could get worship here with deaf people. It was a great change in my life. Most of the people who are deaf in the U.S. today are more typically like this church here. Average or poor working class people and economic things are tough. And by the end of the month, it's tough here. But at the same time, this church can make a difference. After church, it kind of feels like a club. Good relationships, close. I can talk with all different kinds of people, tell them how I feel, my emotions, get them out. It's like a family, good relationships, a lot of love and sharing, understanding, openness from everyone. But deaf society was like American society, and that wasn't always good. In 1925, after an African-American couple tried to attend the NAD convention, the deaf organization explicitly banned black people from joining. The ban was in place for 40 years. In the South, deaf schools, like all schools, were segregated for decades. At the black deaf school, our black deaf culture flourished. We had basketball games, we had our dances, we had black teachers. Moving then to the white deaf school, we all used sign language, but the signs that were being used were very different. 
the white deaf students would fingerspell and then add some signs. As a black deaf person, they would look at my signing and say, that doesn't look like what they did as white deaf students. And so I found myself humiliated. I thought I was inferior and that somehow our signs were inferior to the signs that they were using. And so I tried to put away my signs and instead adopt the signs that were used by that, the white students. Playground. School ground. But deaf students, Door black and white, had many school experiences in common. For one thing, many had gone through the audiogram, a test that measures the ability to detect sound. Farewell. Farewell. And now, an irreverent introduction to the audiogram. Listen by deaf filmmaker Kimby Kaplan. Now, the audiogram is essentially a graph of a person's hearing. It's really the only thing I have in common with an audiogram is that I have one done every single year. So if this doesn't make sense, my audiogram reads at 90 in the left ear, which is my good ear, which means that if I ever have children, God help them, because I ain't. And that means if I get an important phone call from the president, oops, he missed that one. My hands away, and I'm not did and speak, and that when I, you know, talk with you. She feels good, and we. Matter. A lot of people find it annoying, especially when I'm eating and my jaw is moving a lot and it's going. <laughs> when I'm trying to have a conversation with you and my jaw moves and it. <laughs> or when you are getting hot and heavy with someone and that starts to go off again. Most people think when they look at somebody, if they're wearing a hearing aid in one ear and not in the other, they can hear in the hearing aid that they're not wearing. Which is not always the case. I've had a lot of people just immediately start talking to my right ear. At which point, I immediately dance around them. And then they immediately think, oh my god, what a freak. And then we proceed from there. The audiologist gets your headphones adjusted, and the way he or she goes at having you repeat the same list of words you've repeated all your life. Baseball. Hot dog. Rainbow. Audiograms and hearing aids are relatively recent steps in the long parade of deaf technology. Predecessors included the ear trumpet, the ear dome, the vacuophone. But deaf people were unable to use one piece of technology. Alexander Graham Bell's invention, the telephone, for the first 90 years of its existence. I was always trying to find a way to use the telephone. I even thought about Morse code. I had enough hearing that I can use Morse code. But the problem is, who else wants to learn Morse code? No one. Deaf people had to depend on hippie to make calls, call if you're sick, call from your boss, you can't go to work. I remember myself when I, was, when I was a young boy. I was in college and my father had heart surgery and I couldn't call home. I had no teeth to write at them. There were many, many stories of deaf people who died but they couldn't call for emergency. We had to write letters, uh, go to the person's house, knock at the door, nobody home. And even now, they come over, we're not home. And even now, when I was in high school, and uh, a lot of my friends had their own dates and experience. And I, I don't want to be left out or be different from others. I want to show my friends that I do every day. And, but I don't know how to approach the girl. I would rather use the phone and the expert date. So I have to ask my mother or father, mostly my mother, because my father feels so uncomfortable calling for me. And to, uh, I don't know, 
I, I'm sorry to say anybody toy can because I can expect me to ask my mother or my sister or brother to make a phone call and expect it to me. Deaf people needed something that seemed like a contradiction in terms, a deaf telephone. In 1964, a California scientist took a shot at inventing that very thing. Robert Weichbrecht was himself deaf. A brilliant physicist, he'd worked on the Manhattan Project. He lived by himself in a house crammed with spare electrical parts. He was very much a learner. He was a very lonely person too. His best friends were dogs. He loved dogs. And um, they had a personality that was sometimes hard to get along with. He never married. He was married to an ideal. That ideal was access to telephone communication. He was obsessed about that. Whitebreck developed a way to make telephone communication visible using a modem and a teletypewriter. It's key. Each letter, each number on the keyboard were converted to a sound. Those sounds were transmitted through the telephone lines. Then on the other end of the line, another mode then were converted back to printed word. With partners James Marsters and Andrew Sachs, he tested the system. At first, all they got was gibberish. Then, in May 1964, the teletypewriter printed out, in clear English, the first deaf telephone conversation in history. It worked, and deaf people began to build their own phone network, one household at a time. I remember that first conversation. Paul called me, Paul and Patrick. Came word. Then I started typing to Paul and why are you typing so slow? And I said, I just cannot believe you were typing to me and I'm getting it. But then soon I was typing to <laughs> Each user needed to find a phone, a modem, and a teletypewriter. This was not easy. The teletypewriters weighed about 200 pounds, and most were owned by telephone companies which wouldn't give equipment away, even broken down equipment. But deaf people found their own, locating office machinery and warehouse sales and scavenging teletypewriters from scrapyards. A lot of old to Newton telegram We put them in our basement, put them in our garage. I saw the wall between the two deaf communities break it down, because for once we could communicate with other deaf people who did not have similar communication methods. By 1982, the number of TTYs had grown from Whitebreck's initial two to 180,000. The TTY was a giant step for deaf people, but it was just the first one. Over the next 25 years, they would be closed captioning for TV, relay calls, pagers, and video phones. Technology was working for the deaf world. When we decided to build here on the beach for our retirement house, we decided that we wanted to have a house that was open and clear, accessible, and deaf friendly. What makes it a deaf house? It has to have a lot of open spaces. It has to let people see each other. Every time somebody rings the doorbell, the lights flash throughout the house. Technology has really had a strong influence on us. Now we can watch TV and see things that are captioned. It's easier to sit down in our living room and watch TV than get in your car and drive to your local group where they had an old 16 millimeter projector to see a film. Now we will just turn on the TV and the captions are there. The caption films are there. It is great, but it takes away from the fellowship. 
New Englanders manufacture a variety of valuable products from inexpensive raw materials. The making of tiny microphones to be used in hearing aids for deaf people is one of Camden's newest enterprises. In the second half of the 20th century, technology changed life for deaf people. In that same era, sign language made a stunning comeback. The change began in 1955, when a young professor named William Stokey came to teach at Gallaudet. Stokey was a hearing man, but his subject for research would be sign language, a method of communication about which Stokey himself knew almost nothing. We thought, who the hell are you? You don't know deaf people. You didn't grow up with us. You come from another university, and you decide that you know all about sign language? In fact, very few people knew all about sign language. Hearing people considered it a set of gestures that conveyed only the simplest ideas. Many deaf people used it, but they'd been taught to believe that sign was a pale imitation of the spoken word. I grew up oral until about seventh grade. When I did see other deaf people signing, I thought they were apes, monkeys. What's that funny behavior? What are they doing? Why don't they just talk? At Gallaudet, Stokey observed sign language in the hands of masters. He saw that students and deaf faculty were not simply putting English words into signs. There was nothing broken or inadequate about sign, he wrote. On the contrary, it was a complete language of its own. Bill Stokey did something that shook people up. He offered the idea that it was possible to have language in sign. Even deaf people themselves were pretty upset when Stokey had suggested that sign was a language. They had really bought that idea that ASL was not a language. William Stokey was not the typical professor. He rode a motorcycle, played bagpipes in the Gallaudet campus, and stubbornly persisted in his research, though he received little encouragement. In 1960, when he presented his early findings on sign language structure, he was criticized by the hearing faculty for taking sign too seriously, and by the deaf faculty for openly discussing a topic that many deaf people kept to themselves. Many of our deaf friends recall the embarrassment of signing in public. They'd sign low or smaller if they went to a restaurant or to any other public place. During our lives, my wife and I were brainwashed. We were made to believe that signing was a shameful thing. In 1965, the team of William Stokey, Dorothy Casterline, and Carl Cronenberg published a dictionary of American Sign Language. Their dictionary was not alphabetical, but visual, arranging words by the sign's hand shape, location, and movement. We were perceived as the lunatic fringe, Stokey wrote, and we enjoyed that. But their work showed beyond a doubt that ASL is a true language, with its own structure and its own rules, a language that uses the entire body, that accommodates nuance, metaphor, and even mistakes. What's called a slip of the tongue in spoken language is, in sign, a slip of the hand. The linguistic study of ASL that emerged in the 1960s and 70s helped the deaf community. The deaf education community realized that signing has an important place in the classroom. Deaf people use different kinds of ASL depending on the circumstances. And people have their styles. It depends on where you come from. People from southern states have their own dialect. And that dialect is different from the north, the west, or the eastern states. And there are different signs in different regions. And each region will have its own popular lingo as well. People always considered my mother an oral success. She spoke well and could write English fluently. My father's speech and writing was not so good. He was called an oral failure. So they were quite different linguistically, and we saw my father as a failure and my mother as a success. 
Growing up, I thought of my father as not very smart, and my mother as quite intelligent. Later, I went to college and studied ASL grammar and structure. When I went home and saw how my father signed, I was astounded. He signed beautiful ASL with grammatical features and structure, exactly what I had learned in college. My mother, on the other hand, had less of those features. Her ASL was so-so. My father's ASL was outstanding. His English was not great. My mother's was better. But all my life, I'd thought of my father as a language-less person, the dumb one. After learning about ASL, I saw him completely differently. People have recognized that our family had a unique style of sign language because we were so close to one another, and they identified it as a Sapala family accent, if you will. I noticed there are some signs that black deaf people use that white deaf people would not use. that uh, black deaf people show more expression and physically get more uh, into it. Like when they sign girl, you see that with the head nod and the body language to reflect that. And that's just a black way of communicating as opposed to how a white person might say it, just girl, whereas a black person would say, yeah, girl. I mean, they really show that black way of signing and that comes through very clearly. Watching a person tell a story in American Sign Language is like watching a movie. You can see this particular hand movement indicating a person walking a particular path. And you can create dialogue by the way people use body shifts, eye gaze, and head shifts. Special effects, too. You can actually do slow motion. So you see a lot of techniques in ASL storytelling and film that are strikingly very similar. And now, a story of life and death in film and ASL. Vital Signs, by deaf filmmaker Wayne Betts. Your heart is having problems. You may only have a week to live. What? Only one week left to live? The world stops making sense. He sees the doctor talking to him, and then he turns and sees the interpreter signing, and then he gets up and walks out. Outside, he sits down and wonders, how am I going to tell my wife? Looking out over the rail of a bridge to the river below, he turns around, sits on the rail, and he thinks, I'll just let myself go. Falling, falling. Sinking, sinking, blacking out. Suddenly he wakes up, he looks over at his wife. And she starts to wake up. She says, hey, honey, what's wrong with you? I'm fine. She gets up hurt and angry and she storms out. He lies down but feels his heart, his heart. I've got to tell my wife, but she's gone. He rushes to the window and looks down. He can see her taking off in her car. He jumps into his car, turns, gets on the highway. Finally, he sees her car, but it's empty. Where is she? He jumps out and starts walking. 
There she is. My wife. But my heart, it hurts. She gets farther and farther away. He tries to catch up, but he falls to his knees. To the ground. His heart. For decades, deaf clubs had their own drama groups, but they always played to an entirely deaf audience. In the 1960s, as sign language itself gained respect, a startling new company began to perform in sign for the general public, the National Theatre of the Deaf. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to be really deaf? Uh. <laughs> I don't know. It's not an easy question. What would you miss most? Uh, probably music. Tonight. Five, Jim. Five minutes. I'm not teasing you, Bernard. There's a performance tonight. Yes. Bernard? I was born during the time of the Great Depression. So many people were out of work. My father and so many of his friends would sit and talk and complain, expressed their frustrations in terms of looking for jobs and not being able to find any, and discrimination against the deaf. These are dreams, fantasies, wishes, and pressing memories. I started to feel afraid for my own future. Bernard's fear, finding himself on stage, suddenly, unprepared. What would become of me? What would my life be like? NTD was established in 1967. We had no idea what it would mean to us as deaf people and mean to hearing people in general. No idea until we opened in New York and I read the reviews. Welcome to our world. And they were all so positive. Enter. Let us sing, sing together. At NTD, we performed a lot of different kinds of theater, from children's drama to Shakespeare. It's simple. But we created a new play, My Third Eye, by experimenting with our own stories. To introduce the hearing audience to ASL, we would sign three blind mice, and we would invite people to learn how to sign it. But that was too fast. People weren't able to do that. The whole play was built on our own dreams and memories and imagination. It was easy for deaf people to follow because it was part of the deaf world. Bucket. 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 NTD introduced thousands of hearing people to deaf culture. God. To the fact that deaf people had for decades shared language, performance, and even poetry, which can be created in sign language or written first in English and then interpreted through sign. I'd like to do a poem for you that I think is really evocative, so very visual. And the name of the poem is Flowers and Moonlight on the Spring Water.
evening. River. Spring flowers. Moonlight. Stars. By the late 1960s, deaf people could claim a recognized language, a renowned theater company, and their own technical college. The National Technical Institute for the Deaf opened in Rochester in 1968. Other colleges, too, began offering courses in deaf culture and American Sign Language. A while back, I was teaching ASL, and I noticed a sharp increase in hearing students coming in. I was curious. I said, why do you want to learn sign language? And they said, oh, I saw children of a lesser god. Children of a lesser god. Help me. Teach me. Love has a language all its own. Marley Matlin. I was doing the stage production of Children of a Lesser God in Chicago, a smaller role. Love you. My agent called to ask me one question. She said, would you be willing to be nude? And I had to think of a good answer. I said, I'm an actor. Go ahead, as I said on the teletype writer. Two minutes later, she called back and she said, you got it. Well, first she was beautiful. She had a good figure, very attractive, and she, could sw she swam in the nude. And boy, people woke up. And they realized that she's deaf, but she does everything else. I was really excited about the movie because it was the first time deaf people had had a star. Children of a Lesser God was a seminal film for many reasons. A deaf person had a leading role and used sign language throughout the whole film. It also shows relationship of deaf people not just being in isolation by themselves, but interacting with a community and a variety of different ways of use of sign language. It was an important success for deaf actors, but it had problems as well. Some of the editing cut off uh, signs, and that was important because most of the films of children that were shown around the United States in 1986, 87, didn't have captions. When I got the Oscar, it was great. Obviously, it was great. And I got a review from a few movie critics who said, one would say that she was great. She won the Oscar. Congratulations. Marley Matlin did great. But it was a sympathy vote. Because essentially, I, she's just a deaf actress playing a deaf role. When I went back to the Oscars to present the Oscar for Best Actor. By nominating the following actors for Best Performance in a Leading Role, you have honored each one magnificently. The nominees for Best Actor in a Motion Picture are... I spoke the names of the actors. The right person got up and got the award, so I must have said something right. Many people had hoped that she would be a pioneer from our community. That she would sign at the awards, and that would impress the audience. Just a few days later, there was an, a magazine, a deaf magazine, that said, offensive, and I was like, what now? 
uh, I, I got used to hearing people making comments about me, but now I was getting it from deaf people because I chose to speak. And we all looked to her for validation, but when she spoke, our hopes were dashed. I wasn't thinking, I'm standing in front of hearing people, and I'm deaf, and I'm Marley Matlin, and don't forget it. I didn't even think of it that way. I was just a normal human being who was giving an award. Marley Matlin's decision to speak at the Oscars was controversial within the deaf community, but in the wider hearing world, her award was a symbol of the changing times. For decades, minorities in the U.S. had been demanding greater rights. Deaf people now joined the struggle. We rode on the wave of the civil rights movement to make some changes. We had the right to education. We had the right to interpreters. We had the right to captioning. And we need to be thankful to the civil rights movement. The most significant civil rights struggle in deaf history began small, with a group of young Gallaudet alumni who shared a dream, a deaf president for Gallaudet. There were very, very few people who could envision having a deaf president of Gallaudet. During the summer of 1987, when we knew the president was leaving, we felt it would be a good idea to start talking about a deaf president to get the word out. We looked at other universities, such as historically black colleges. Their presidents were black. And we thought, well, you know, they're already doing it. Why can't we have a deaf president at Gallaudet? Some people said, how could a deaf president be a good recruiter for students? How could they do fundraising if they were deaf? How would a deaf person be able to communicate well? And so, in a way, they were asking questions about our own value and our own ability to get along in the world. The crucial moment arrived in March 1988. The Board of Trustees had chosen three finalists, one hearing, two deaf. But on March 6, the board made its choice. The new president was Dr. Elizabeth Zinzer, the only hearing candidate. As the news spread, a protest began. What? Everybody was mad. When? God damn it! We were ready to get arrested. Then Gary Olson, who was the former executive director of the NAD, stood up and got everybody's attention. And he said, we're standing here in the middle of the street, in the middle of the cold, and we don't know what to do. The board is over there at the Mayflower Hotel, drinking their fancy wine, eating delicious food, and laughing at us. Talk about inciting a group of people. Then we just all started to move. We didn't even know where the hotel was. We had no idea where we were going. We just came out of the front gate and started marching. And the police kept coming up and saying, you can't march, you don't have a permit. But we just kept on walking. According to the police, you will be arrested. Your position. OK, OK, wait, 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 wait. I want an announcement. The board will meet, will meet. They have a meeting with two representatives. Tim. That was just mind-boggling to the board, because we as a group showed up wanting an answer. Why did you pick Dr. Zinzer? You say that the woman Zinzer is the best qualified, the best Qualified? I don't know what Zinzer can do that King and Corson cannot do. But well, what? Exactly what? I want you to try to give her a chance. Let her talk to you. The, when the campus... A lot of student leaders started emerging when the protest began. And they immediately went and hot-wired some school buses. 
Hearing people were shocked to learn that deaf people knew how to hotwire. But they took all the buses, blocked all the exits, and flattened the tires. What followed was the most celebrated event in deaf history. For seven days, the Deaf President Now movement held rallies and press conferences, took over the campus TV station, and shut down classes. The protesters controlled the campus. Even the vice president found himself locked out. The board refused to change their minds but agreed to a public meeting with the students in the gym on Monday. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry. Tim, Ross, I don't know where you are. Are you around somewhere? As soon as the chairman, Jane Spillman, started talking, Dr. Harvey Goodstein cut her off, and he said, the board has not agreed to our demands. There's no point in listening. Let's go. And then the fire alarms went off. There were a lot of lights. It was noisy. But for deaf people, you know, there was no noise. It was just some flashing lights. Time to get out of the building. And Spillman, you could see Spillman waving her hand, trying to get people's attention. And they just ignored her and left. And then she said, how can you understand me with all this noise? The world jumped into the wagon with us. Really, that's what hit me the most. I could see students' faces. You could see it in their eyes. They just started to light up. This is something we can do. Students were realizing, wow, the press. The press actually showed up and listened to us. And that's when I said, oh, this is for real. What are you and other students uh, going to do if the board does not change its mind and Ms. Zinzer does uh, become the president? We will uh, stay with our demands. We will not give up. We will not concede. We do not feel at this point that we can compromise. We have been conceding so many things for so many years that we feel that this time it's uh, their turn to compromise and make the concessions. They are not going to give in. Um, what will you do? Well, at this point in time, I am serving as president. I came into Washington today uh, not having anticipated taking on my responsibility. But when the newly appointed president came myself. to Washington, she could not set foot on the Gallaudet campus. The protesters simply refused to budge. Are the students prepared to continue blocking the entrance uh, as long as the board refuses to meet the demands? We give up our soul in order to get a deaf president. I remember being interviewed by a reporter from Jerusalem. And he wanted to know what was happening, why we were doing this. And I just said, I'm doing this for my parents. They have suffered. They have been discriminated against and oppressed. We tend to view the majority as being the oppressor in that they really don't want us to succeed. But during that week, during the protest, ABC News took a poll and they asked people if they supported the protest. They found 93% of the population supported us. 93%. I have never seen 93% in a poll like that before. I love you. This is where the American Postal Workers Union stands. Support came from all over. Groups across the country sent money and help. Assign three times, please assign us three times for the people here. Deaf President now. Everywhere, students shut down deaf schools. Even politicians chimed in. Jesse Jackson and the vice president, George Bush, sent letters of support. We felt a real connection to the civil rights fight. 
We even borrowed the banner, We Have a Dream, that came from the Civil Rights Marches. We were so proud to be able to carry that. In Washington today, some 2,500 jubilant Gallaudet students and their supporters rallied on Capitol Hill after forcing the resignation of the newly named president at the School for the Deaf. Elizabeth Ann Zinter resigned last night after being named to the post Sunday. Students shut the school down all week with their protest. Today, they vowed to press for other demands. Today, I submitted my resignation from the chairmanship of the Board of Trustees of Gallaudet University and from the board. Unconditional surrender. After a nine-hour meeting, the trustees accepted all the student demands. DPN changed American politics. People who were supposedly unable to handle responsibility had organized a powerful protest, taken over a college, and won. Two years later, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, a law that made it illegal to discriminate against people with disabilities. It's interesting. When I talked to my kids about what happened, they were so surprised. There was a hearing president? And I'm like, yes, there was a hearing president. All of the future presidents of Gaudet will be deaf. I would guess they'll all be deaf in different ways. Oh, one person will be deaf in his or her way, and another person will be deaf in his or her way, and that's fine. So I, I work to encourage people to understand that there's not one way to be deaf. Deafness, in a sense, is a pliable state, a way of being that can be changed or shaped, like a marshmallow. And now... That's My Marshmallow, by deaf filmmaker Tracy Salloway. This is the stand of story. And this is my story. Back in 1964, my grandmother encouraged my mother to take me to see a doctor. Anna, you're blocking your sister's view. Anna's not responding. Maybe something's wrong with her. I've completed the physical examination on your daughter. Um, fortunately, your daughter has difficulties with communication and shows sign of cognitive impairment. Basically, she's mentally retarded. There's nothing wrong with your daughter's behavior. I don't see anything wrong with the child. She will be fine. Ma'am, go home. There's nothing wrong with your daughter. Diagnosis shows that your daughter is deaf. Then I started auditory and speech programs that would take years to practice. Okay? Say the word airplane. Airplane. Say the word cowboy. Cowboy. When I was 12 years old, I had my first slumber party. I tried to hide the fact of my deafness. When I was in California. <laughs> you were laughing, weren't you, Jimmy? Are you deaf? Um, no. Hey! <laughs> okay, girls, it's time to go to sleep. Aww. <laughs> I wanted to admit I was deaf, but I was afraid to show my true self. It was as if I didn't yet know how to be deaf. Good morning, boy and girl. Let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Did I want to have deaf friends? Did I want to speak or sign? Now we're going to begin a spelling test. Spell the word magic. Spell the word secret. Spell the word death. I 
have developed my connections with people who know sign language. I support oral and American sign language methods. That is myself, inside and out, my marshmallow, my story. What is yours? Today, the parents of deaf children face some forbidding and agonizing questions. How should we teach our deaf children to communicate? What kind of school should they have? Should we put our faith in technology? Juliet failed the hearing screening in the hospital. They said she wasn't hearing up to 112 decibel levels, which means you could not hear a jet engine if you were standing right next to it. Um, and, um, and that's when the audiologist gave us a binder about cochlear implants. They took some food outside. They took some food outside. Since the mid-1980s, a powerful medical technology has become increasingly popular. The cochlear implant bypasses part of the ear and sends electrical impulses directly to the auditory nerve. Part of the device is internal, surgically embedded within the ear. The implant is permanent, and the procedure destroys any residual hearing in the affected ear. I just couldn't believe we could actually um, do this, what seemed so in invasive. But um, you might be able to see there's a little, yeah, there's a, there's like what's essentially a magnet kind of globs on like the refrigerator magnets. <laughs> um, and this is just a microphone. And then she's wearing a box at her body level, which is a processor. When I put these on, it kind of went the magnet, yes. Then I turn it on, and I hear sound. And he had nothing to do with it. He don't know you more than anything. The first time I went for my, my pig, when I heard sound for the first time, they put it on. Price it, sir. And because I had experience with hearing aid with an ear mode, I sort of tried to listen here. The first sound I heard was up here. And I said, there's something up here in his ear, then a sound, and I thought, my ears up here. So you really look through my head, not up here. People think the cochlear implant is an automatic way to learn spoken language. However, there are millions of peer cells that pick up and transmit sound to the brain that the cochlear implant cannot replicate. The cochlear implant only has about like 26 channels, and it's not enough to really uh, power normal hearing. It means that the child has to work hard to learn what the sounds mean. Before she had her cochlear implant, we all decided we would try to learn how to sign because it just gave her access to concepts. I mean, even before the implant went in, she could ask. She had, I don't know, maybe 10 signs at that point, water, milk, um, you know, her bear, that she, her bear. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, and, and now with the implant, the signing, I feel, has been kind of a bridge between the words she's hearing and the words we're signing, and she knows this sound, milk, means milk. Um, and, and she's been picking up, I, her first words that she said have been her signing words. I remember when I was growing up, because I was so, say, disconnected from my parents and the fact that they enjoyed music and hearing everything, and it was very tough for me. I can remember my mom trying to introduce me to other deaf people. And I did meet one girl who had the same background as I, um, she, though, had a cochlear implant, and it was very successful for her. And I thought, well, whatever it is, I want what she has. I was just looking for a way that I could get hooked back into their world and feel a part of it, like I belonged there somehow. What is today? What's today? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, right. Thursday, Thanksgiving, right. Are you an Indian, dressed up like an Indian? Yes. What are those? 
feathers. Feathers. Yeah. Feathers. Right. And what's the blue thing on your pack? That helps you hear better. It sure does. A lot of money. Yes, there was a lot of money. I used it a lot. <laughs> Use it when I was in bed. I was asleep and I would have it on. It didn't feel like it could connect uh, totally 100% with the hearing world, but at least I was a little closer that way. Where are they going? In those early years, I was placed in a deaf program and that was within a hearing elementary school. So it's a mainstream setting. And then I started to recognize that I was different from everyone else. I started to begin to think, you know, what makes me different from them? And it was this box and this wire that was attached to my head. And so I quit wearing it. I just took it off. In about 10th grade, I decided that I needed a better social life. So I started checking things out. I was very assertive in my research. I came upon the Florida School for the Deaf and made the switch to that school. I went back to wearing the implant again, and I began wearing it all the time. So it's kind of unusual, just the opposite of what you would think, because my parents were very concerned that once I went to the school for the deaf that I would stop wearing it entirely. I wouldn't speak any longer. I wouldn't wear the implant. But the opposite is what happened. And it's because I had confidence in myself. Everybody there was just like I was. Everybody else had a problem with their hearing. So it was OK. It gave me the opportunity to wear my implant and feel like I fit in and really take advantage of everything that it had to offer. An implant often means a kind of balancing act, balancing a deaf life with the arrival of sound, and even balancing the sound itself. And now, adjusting to life with two cochlear implants. Equilibrium by deaf filmmaker Adrian Manjardi.
Good morning, sweetheart. Parents of deaf children face another daunting choice. What kind of school is right for my child? It's a crucial question. Most deaf children today are mainstreamed, but there are still schools exclusively for deaf students. These deaf schools vary widely in their approach, so the environments at two schools can seem like two different planets. At the Maryland School for the Deaf, every class is taught in sign language. We teach kids how to read and write, count, learn about science, history, government, computers, career and technology, and so forth. We want our students to receive information directly from their teachers, meaning no interpreters are involved. All of our teachers sign. Which is the angle of X? When you're done with that, you can clean up the equipment. Did you all read it already? OK, let's have your paper. I want to change my paper. That last paragraph of yours, do you mind expanding on it? I was born hearing and at 14 months got a severe illness and lost my hearing then. But my parents didn't know quite what to do with me as a deaf child, so they looked for information about schools. Daniel was the first deaf person that either one of us have ever met. The first thing I thought was I wanted him to talk. But as we became more and more educated in deafness, I'm, I'm trying to figure, how can somebody who can't hear learn without having some type of visual language? First thing we did was call the deaf school. Language is developed from the ages of zero to five, regardless of whether it's a signed language or Italian or English. We realized that sign language was something that could be adopted by a very young person very quickly as a first language. That was my most important uh, thing, is to have him have a language. If you walk through this campus, the only thing that you see that's different is this is quiet and a public school is loud. <laughs> the same conversations go on, the same things happen, and every aspect of this school is any other school. Daniel's first language is ASL, and our second language is signing. The issues are the same. I've talked about sex with him. We've <laughs> talked about, you know, all, all, all kinds <laughs> of different things. And I feel like we're not missing anything. Um, we've both immersed ourselves into the deaf culture. We've, we've both um, have deaf friends that we see and we communicate with. I'm in both worlds. I'm in the hearing world. I'm in the deaf world. I mean, I'm lucky because my parents can sign. Some of these other kids have no opportunity to communicate with their parents. They can only write back and forth, and the parents only have minimal signs like, I love you, and that's it. So definitely, I want to thank my parents for everything they've done for me. If Daniel wants to get a cochlear implant when he's 25 years old, he's free to do that. If he wanted to put a hearing aid on, and we tried hearing aids when he was younger, that, that's a different story. You can always take that out. A cochlear implant is such a permanent thing. Would I like him to hear music? Would I like him to hear the rain? Would I like him to hear the leaves rustling in the ground? He has no idea what that sounds like, so he's not missing any of it. But yes, I would like that to happen. I mean, that, that would be something that would be wonderful, I think, for any deaf person to hear. Um, but, but a miracle to one day, Daniel, I'll turn around and Daniel is hearing, that, that would not be who he is as a person. I play air hockey. My wife. Who's that? Mom, wife, 
jogging. The other day when I came to your classroom, we talked about... The Clark School in Northampton, Massachusetts, has always been a strictly oral school. That's right. My the first state is finding Irish. It is this island. It's very small. And a church about 285 miles off northwest of Hawaii coast. Sign is never used in the classroom. Daffodils. It used to be that you were dealing strictly with vision and very limited auditory input. Today, what you're dealing with is almost exclusively auditory input, either through high quality hearing aids or through cochlear implantation, which takes a child or has the potential to take a child who is profoundly, even totally deaf by any acoustic standard and to give that child the opportunity to become hard of hearing. I'm deaf and my sister is deaf and I have two hearing parents that are, who, that are very helpful and they'll take care of me and they'll repeat when I don't understand things and my sister too. And I'll help my sister and we both understand how it is to be deaf. It needs to be tighter because it's too loose. Are you sure that my shirt? We were overwhelmed when we found out, first of all, about Patrick's hearing loss. It's something that we suspected, and it wasn't confirmed until he was nine months old. We took a leap. Uh, we trusted the people here at Clark, and um, we put him into the uh, preschool, and within a year, he had pretty much stopped signing, except at home, because they don't sign here. And uh, he was speaking. And the implant has helped me a lot. I can keep up with people when they talk, and I can talk on the phone, and I can understand the music, like to the lyrics, more often. Don't uh, assume that technology will fix your child, because it won't. My children are both very high-functioning oral deaf children, young adults, but they are deaf. They are still deaf. They will always be deaf. Today, enrollment at many deaf schools is on the decline. 85% of deaf children spend their entire education in regular public schools, in mainstream programs. Deaf children in those classrooms use hearing aids, cochlear implants, or sign language interpreters to follow lectures and discussions. I was in a mainstream program. I was surrounded by hearing people. I never was segregated into a deaf classroom. My friends, in general, I would say treated me pretty good, with the exception of the cochlear implant, which was really obvious. Then the remarks started to come. They called me a freak. They said I was strange. They'd say, what's that? Is it really part of your body? It's like a foreign object. Often, because deafness is a low incidence uh, disability, they may be the only child in the classroom, or maybe in their grade or in their school. And so they can stand out in that way. And, and so if we don't do some things to help them be successful in the mainstream, they may struggle and, and have other effects down the road. You know, when we're raised orally as solitaires, and then at some point in our lives, when we're 12, when we're 18, when we're 25, when we're 40, we realize that there's a whole group of people like us who use sign language. We ha it's just like, wow. And so I call that met deaf wow. It's like a common experience. You grow up, you think you're the only one, and then you find out you're not, you're not alone and you're like thrilled to meet other people who have your common experience and you just want to be with them, become friends, learn the language, hang out, you're home. I'm not normal. And I'd like to remain that way. I like being different. But of course, as I was growing up, I always wanted to be normal. So I think I learned how to sort of make my way through that fine line of being normal and being who I am. 
In terms of a disability, I don't view myself as having a disability whatsoever. I function like any hearing person can. My deafness does not deprive me of anything. I can do anything I want, except maybe sing. Back in my Gallaudet days, I was a student at the university and I was walking down the hallway in the dorms one day and I felt the vibration. There was something going on. And there was a guy playing a guitar. Earphones connected right to the guitar. And I was just like, wow, you know, I'm a drummer. And I said, well, where are your drums? And he said, well, I don't have them with me. So I told him to use the chair and use a ruler for his sticks. And I said, show me what you have. Beethoven's Nightmare is a really unique band consisting of three deaf musicians. Each of us have our own instruments. We have a drummer, we have a bass guitar, and we have a rhythm guitar. And one person tries to sing. The way I play, I depend on a lot of vibrations, so we play really, really loud, enough for us to hear and feel it. You know, you go to regular rock concerts and they are loud, and it made me wonder, how do they stand it? because it's really too loud for the regular hearing person. They're going to become deaf themselves, but for us, we already are, so it's perfect. As deaf people, we have a rhythm inside our bodies, and we're famous for being storytellers. It's a huge, important part of deaf culture. You can see a beautiful storyteller telling a story in ASL, it's just fantastic. And to pair it with that beat, the creativity that it elicits is wonderful. It can really be paired with any story you want. ASL is a beautiful language, and we don't want to lose the language. We're always going to have some fear, in my opinion. I think that's part of being a cultural group, being embedded within a larger society, people who are different from us. We're constantly living in some fear in the back of our minds that we will lose what we have. I know there are people who think with genetics, with technology, with changes that are happening in the future that deafness will disappear. I, I don't believe that. I think there always will be deafness and there always will be a need for people who are not deaf to understand deaf people. What's wrong with being deaf? I'm deaf. I'm fine. I function fine. I drive. I have a family. I've made a baby. I make people laugh. I travel. What the hell is going on? I have to hear? That has nothing to do with it. It's all about knowledge. It's about the heart. It's about abilities, about doing something you want and getting what you want out of life. And not because you get a cochlear implant and everything is going to be great. No, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, no. Knowledge is the most powerful vehicle to success. Not hearing, not speaking, reading, yes. Reading and taking in all that book knowledge and being able to use it. That's the power of the universe, the force, knowledge, not hearing. So thank you very much. The end. Roll credits.
To further explore the history of deaf life in America, visit pbs.org. Major funding for Through Deaf Eyes is provided by... This program has been made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding for more than 30 years of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Annenberg Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.